Welcome to NCBA's Cattleman's Call podcast with host Lane Nordland. All righty, friends, welcome back to another Cattleman's Call podcast. Lane Nordland, happy to be with you as always. And today we are broadcasting, recording this conversation from the Nugget Hotel and Casino. No, we're not on a gambling junket. We're here at the summer business meeting of the cattle industry and it's been quite the event and uh, record numbers for the summer business meeting post-COVID uh, shutdown and a lot of producers from across the nation here working on interim policy. And uh, we're kind of at the halfway point uh, for, for the year when it comes to uh, I- the NCBA uh, leadership team. And joining us here today is NCBA President Don Schiefelbein, President-elect Todd Wilkinson, and Vice President Mark Isley. And, of course, uh, Don Hells from Minnesota. Todd from South Dakota and Wyoming is where Mark calls home. And uh, kind of a diverse selection there weather-wise uh, f- for the year. Uh, Don, how, how are things out in your country? You said that you got about an inch and a half of rain just last night. Oh, yeah, and it was a lifesaver. I tell you what, we were in a little dry pocket. So most, uh, if you go 50 miles north of us, 50 miles south of us, it's been the Garden of Eden. And then the God centered a little dry spot on us about a 300 miles wide, but about 50 miles deep. But we got that badly needed rain last night. So as Todd said, boy, that's going to be good for the soybean crop. Oh, definitely. And Todd, for yourself over in South Dakota, what, what was the weather situation like in your region? And what's it like kind of going here through uh, July and August? Well, I got to tell you that if you'd have talked to me in April, I was wondering where I was going to put my calves. Between the cold weather and the fact that we didn't have any rain, I'd never seen our pastures look in bleaker conditions. But in contrast to that right now, we are uh, in awesome shape. The grass just literally exploded when the rain hit, and uh, our corn and our bean crop in my, my area looks pretty good. That's good to hear. And uh, Mark, for yourself, I know we did a TV show just a few days ago, and uh, it always seems around Cheyenne Frontier Day as a weather event occurs in your neck of the woods. But uh, leading up until Cheyenne Frontier Day, is that, what's it been like in that neck of Wyoming? You know, we had a nice calving season. It was it was warm enough. We had a lot of wind, but um, then it turned dry, and it turned cold and hot and cold and hot and cold and hot. And uh, the hay crops just kind of went dormant. Mm-hmm. Uh, even the weeds gave up. But we had a lot of old grass from the year before, and we're, we went into it feeling fairly uh, uh, positive. Well, it's good to hear kind of the same situation in my neck of the woods. Just uh, those cool season grasses didn't get enough rain, and, and uh, the weather wasn't too great, so our hay crop didn't look good. But eastern Montana, there's a lot of hay. So there's probably more hay in the state of Montana than there's been in three or four years, oh, wow. which is which is good to hear. Um, that's really one of the driving factors Excellent. of uh, herd liquidation and uh, up in our neck of the woods. Uh, but uh, th- thanks for those weather updates. I, I just think it's good to kind of get a feel for what weather's like in, in your different uh, neck of the woods uh, in terms of uh, what producers are experiencing and and hey I, I should mention i don't want to forget to thank our sponsor of today's show we want to thank Beefmaster for uh, continuing their support of the podcast they're a new sponsor of the show so big shout out to our friends at Beefmaster. we'll hear more about what they provide the cattle industry here later in the report but obviously we're here in uh, in reno at the summer business meeting um obviously we've had to pull you know a few people off the craps tables probably to come to <laughs> no. <laughs> actually that was uh, i heard a hotel staffer comment they're like we thought we'd see more cowboy hats down in the casino and I'm like they're all in policy meetings like they're <laughs> they're they're here to get business done but uh, I, I guess what are some of those current key issues that uh, have been discussed here uh, halfway through the year in terms of that policy book that is vital to NCBA's uh, uh, mission out in Washington, D.C.? Uh, I guess, Don, I could start with you. And, and if anyone wants to jump in with kind of what, what some of those key issues that states are bringing forward this week. Yeah, we're, we're trying to prep for that farm bill. As you know, that's the largest bill that we do, and we do it every four or five years. So it, it's the one that's front and center. And I guess uh, sitting in some of those committees, I was just pleased and excited to see the grassroots input on items and thought process that they say, you know what, if we could tweak it this way or tweak it that way, it would be a much better farm bill. So I thought kudos to the membership for giving us that kind of insight. Yeah. And so what were some of those key issues, Todd, that you were that you were seeing and hearing from the members ma- making some of those small tweaks? And because, you know, you, you will hear 
cattle producers say, well, the farm bill is all about crop producers. Well, that's, <laughs> that's where we went. I kind of set the record straight and how important it is to have that input from the livestock industry as a vital uh, safety net as well. Yeah, I think you, any of your listeners would understand that uh, livestock risk protection is uh, critical and that product has become much more valuable uh, for the industry. You know, we've always watched our, uh, our farmer friends with their corn and their bean insurance um, um, have an adequate protection level there. And, and finally, we're getting a product in the, in the cattle industry that's really starting to, to make a difference for producers. And, and that certainly is news um, as to how to work that mm-hmm. and, and um, making it available to producers all across the country. Because it's not just the cow-calf guy. It's the feedlot operator. They've upped the numbers. They've, uh, they've increased the amount that the government is, is reimbursing on that. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's some good news for a change. Because we don't normally have a safety net of any sort. Yep. We just kind of dangle over the, over the precarious edge all the time. So it's great to have that. Yeah. Well, and you look at all those unforeseen issues that could pop up, wildfire, snow blizzards that just pop up out of nowhere. And for, for in the past, that, that the cattle producer has been left with very few options. And obviously, over the years, NCBA members have brought these issues forward to, to, the, uh, to the front of these issues in previous farm bills and here this week as well. Yeah, and I think what we need to, the message that Washington needs to keep hearing is that we need those programs to continue. Um, you know, you've, you've finally got a product uh, for some of us that, that's working. Uh, don't, don't tweak it out of existence. Uh, kind of do no harm, I guess, is, is the message that we're trying to convey. Yep. And, and I would add the most one of the key elements of that program, and it's, it's crucial to all breeders of all sizes, but, you know, with that LRP program, the entry number is one head. So it's giving you protection from the smallest of our members to some of our very largest members. So to me, that's a really a key element that regardless of your size, here's a price protection mechanism that's <laughs> available for your use. Well, and it's just always amazing when a farm bill gets completed, it's time for another farm bill. Uh, Mark, what's what's your thoughts on You know, I, I'd have to echo uh, Don and Todd's thoughts on that. I, I think that the Farm Bill was front and center on that, and I think since about two-thirds of the country is in some form of drought, uh, from s- extreme to exceptional to, to moderate, they're thinking about that, and I think that the, the livestock and the forage protection programs have really taken front and center. And we're concerned, of course, if uh, what happens if there's a change of, of uh, sway in the House, uh, who will fund that and how it will be funded. And I think Todd's uh, comment not to do no harm would be right on the money. Well, and one opportunity that the three of you have to, to travel the countryside, you know, attending the, the, the mid-year meetings of our cattlemen and stock grower groups, uh, the annual conventions, you get to have that face-to-face interaction with producers. You might uh, hear some really good feedback. You might hear some you know, areas where they want to see some improvement. So as you've Travel the country, uh, especially this summer. What what have been some of the takeaways that you've uh, the dialogue you've had with cattle producers, just uh, on what NCBA uh, is doing and can do for them? Don, I'll start with that. Well, I think the thing that's been really resonating through as I've been traveling is optimism. There is a lot of enthusiasm and excitement for the future. And just back forward a couple of years ago and see everything that we've gone through. It's amazing to see as you travel across the optimism, enthusiasm, excitement. And the other thing is that they just appreciate real cattlemen coming to their meetings and talking honestly and frankly and openly. And to me, NCBA has to get much, much better at that and continuing that. We're going to be straightforward. We're going to be honest. We're going to be transparent. We're going to lay the ground the way it is. Yep. And to me, they really, really have been receptive to that kind of message. You know, I always joke, uh, Don, there's there's no one, even during the dip, most difficult times, there's no one more optimistic than a livestock auctioneer on the block. <laughs> so it's always nice when the, when the, when the cow-calf guys and the feeders can get a little more optimistic as well. But uh, I, I always, I got to give my auctioneer friends out there a little grief. You know, they, they work hard. They, they get us good prices as well. But uh, uh, Mark, for yourself, being out and about, uh, I know Wyoming just celebrated 
150 years uh, of being an association. They're a few years behind Colorado, but they're one of the oldest uh, organizations in the nation association-wise. But uh, uh, what has been the input you've heard and, and the opportunities to talk with cattlemen and women? Well, you know, we had we had an exceptional celebration, our 150th, a uh, lot of participation. And, and, and livestock producers are one of the most optimistic uh, bunch of folks on the, on the planet. We always are looking forward to something good and yet always need someone to watch our back. And, and I think so they still raise concerns about uh, judicial and, and legislative and uh, regulatory overreach, that sort of thing. But the, the cattle market's coming up, uh, the production levels and, and the, all the availability of some of the herd health things. They were all very much buoyed by that, and, and there was some there was some optimism throughout the, throughout the whole entire convention. And Lane, I was at that meeting as well. And one thing I just really enjoyed is, boy, the Wyoming group has just a really really good relationship with their governor. Mm-hmm. And to meet their governor and have him at the events, and I, I kidded with them because I I looked around and I'm like expecting to see all the Secret Service or protection agents with him, right? <laughs> and I went up to the governor. I said, "Well, where's all the protection?" He opened up his coat. And there he had a sidearm right <laughs> on him. He said, in Wyoming, we do it the old-fashioned way. We defend ourselves. And I just, I just got a big kick out of that, Mark. Well, you know, you were really well-received, and, and we had a lot of folks that were happy to see you and the governor uh, and, and have those conversations about the issues that are commonplace for everybody. It was, it was a great time. Oh. I, d- I just got to tell you that um, uh, Don maybe doesn't have a good relationship with with his governor, but uh, my governor is particularly cute and, and really nice. So I, I will I will say all I hear as I go across the country is uh, everybody wants to know if my governor is going to run for, for president. So that's a positive comment to hear for the South Dakota governor. But Lane, I would actually add on that, you know, the influence that these state organizations have in their local pol- politics, you know, here I am traveling across the country and no fewer than six governors have I met when I go to their annual convention. It's just how you get that state organization involved with that political aspect to make sure that laws are being working for the, the working folks out there. So I, I'm just very impressive. Yeah, you got to meet uh, Governor Gianforte in Montana two summers ago. Yes, in, in DeSantis. And I mean, yep. I, yep. there's a string of them. I met... Uh, uh, Todd's governor as well. In fact, I think she liked me more than Todd. <laughs> and Todd, is there anything else you want to add in, in your travels uh, here over the last few months uh, since we were last down in Houston, just being able to be boots on the ground and and uh, again, showing that uh, as a leader, you're, you're attending these events and, and representing NCBA, but also the members out in the countryside? Yeah, I, I think what you, uh, b- because of the role I'm serving in uh, the traceability working group, uh, that's naturally a topic that I'm into wherever I'm at. And, you know, what uh, USDA uh, gave us an indication that they're probably going to come out with this rule in December or uh, uh, January in terms of, of traceability on, on breeding livestock. And, you know, it's not a question of if. I think it's a question of when. And if we don't get on top of this uh, animal disease traceability issue, we're going to have a problem. And all you have to do is, is look to our, our friends in the poultry industry and understand the, the devastation that's gone on across the country. And we can't have that happen in the beef industry. We, we can't suffer billions of dollars of impact from a foot and mouth or, or something like that. So moving that issue along, it's been identified in the long-range plan for multiple um, uh, plans the last three, I believe. And, and we just have to get this across the, the finish line because it's so critical for our industry to get that protection. Now, Todd, it, it, this is a, it can be a confusing issue. It can be an emotional issue. So when someone approaches you uncertain about it or maybe fearful of uh, traceability, uh, as you said, it's, it's good to understand what the poultry industry has gone through. But, but how do you take the emotion out of that conversation and share the facts and uh, how, how much work has been put into the working group in the years that have looked into the, the issues when it comes to traceability. So, so the way I approach it is, uh, and I think it's, it's a number of people have talked about this issue. We all have insurance on our vehicles. We all have insurance on, I have insurance on whether my bulls are, are, are going to uh, semen test, but if we're talking about animal disease protection, really what we're talking about with traceability is an insurance policy. So when a producer comes up and said, I, I can't afford that, I can't, I can't uh, put that tag in, 
look at it as a cost of production. And if you can minimize your risk, um, that's the best way to look at it. If, if you're going to take the attitude, I don't want to put a tag in anything, then understand that you're, you're creating a risk for your herd and your neighbor's herd. Why not minimize that risk so if there is an outbreak, they don't come in and close you off from, from uh, commerce. And this way, we can be proactive rather than reactive. Well, well, thanks for sharing your, your insight on that. And l- like I said, it, it, it is a, it's an emotional issue for a lot of producers out there. And, uh, and, and, and I know that's why you guys are out on the ground on so many of these issues to, to talk about them and, and, and share how the policy is created. And maybe, maybe I should add to that. That's, that, that's why we're here at this, this event. It, it's for policy creation and the team out in Washington, DC, Ethan's team and, and out there, they have to follow that policy book. And uh, obviously, the key policy is set uh, every uh, February, but this is also a time for interim policy to come forward and policy creation at the upcoming convention as well. And, and Lane, let me just emphasize that a little more because it's such a key point. You know, when somebody takes over the presidency like I do, they act like, okay, this is Don Schiefelbein's NCBA. No, I get my marching orders exactly from what the members decide with the policies that they pass at the meeting today. That is our marching orders. That is what we're charged to do. It's not the Don Schiefelbein show. It's the members of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association show. And I think that's a very key point. You know, we mentioned Wyoming, 150 years. Uh, last time I was in this hotel, it was the American Sheep Industry Association's 150th convention. There used to be a Gillies bar as well downstairs and got to meet Mickey Gilly. <laughs> um, but uh, Ed Avalos used to be an undersecretary of agriculture and when I used to gamble, we were playing on a roulette table, and Ed chipped my tooth. And he he hit big, and I was taking a drink out of my beer, and he <laughs> chipped my tooth. Oh, sorry to hear that. So fond memories here in the Nugget yeah. Casino Resort. But uh, just just want to bring shout out to our friends in the sheep industry with that story. Uh, but uh, you know, Don, you're halfway through your your year of service, and it's a, it, it it just shows how fast time goes. Um, uh, what, what has it been like? I guess what has been the best part about uh, being out on the road and, and serving in this position as, you know, you've served on the executive committee and, and the, the board for, for many years. What, what's that been like as you kind of see your time winding down? Well, I think the perspective you get as you start to travel across the country and see all the various organizations is just how big this organization is and how big the beef industry is and how diverse it is. When you start traveling from Arizona to Tennessee to Florida to Minnesota to Montana, boy, this industry is diverse and its needs are diverse. And that's why it is so important as you go out and engage at these regional meetings or or state meetings that you hear what their particular thoughts are because what's needed in Florida is far different what's needed in Arizona, et cetera. And I just think that that lens of being able to visit with members and see all that diversity and making sure we're covering all the needs of our entire beef industry, to me, that is what shined the brightest, I guess, as I was traveling around. Well, that's good to hear. And I, I should ask, uh, any more family members uh, pop up on the operation at the colony over there? <laughs> Actually, uh, there's two or three more pregnancies. So we're, <laughs> that's so, what I was so asking. we're moving forward. <laughs> and uh, uh, again, uh, if you'd like to learn more about Don's uh, family operation, Schiefelbein Farms over there in Minnesota, uh, past podcast we've discussed it, uh, really intriguing it and uh yeah, really interesting to learn more about your family dynamics and the transition. So I'd encourage our, our friends to go listen to that past podcast as well. But hey, we do need to take a quick commercial break and thank our sponsors of today's podcast. We'll be back in just a jiffy here from the Nugget Casino Resort at the Cattle Industry Summer Business Meeting here in Reno. The Beefmaster excels in all maternal traits. They get bred easily year in and year out. They make raising good calves look easy and possess excellent longevity, not breaking down in tough environments. Research shows the breed ranks above others for feed efficiency, one of the most important production traits. If your cow herd has lost its ability to adapt, maybe it's time to rebuild with proven Beefmaster females. Nothing beats a Beefmaster. Learn more about what the Beefmaster cow can do at beefmasters.org. Well, again, thank you to our sponsors of the 
Cattlemen's Call podcast. We truly appreciate their support of uh, the conversations we have with producers from across the nation. Again, joining us uh, today is President of NCBA, Don Schiefelbein, President-elect Todd Wilkinson, and Vice President Mark Isley. And uh, Don, I-, I was just asking you before the break about you know traveling over the past uh, ha- half of the year for, as president. you got a few more uh, months left in the position, but uh, you've also been able to, to travel overseas, uh, go to the United Kingdom, uh, discuss the value of U.S. beef exports, Sports, and obviously there's a lot of trade talk with the EU or with the UK, excuse me, leaving the EU, a lot of opportunities uh, to create more beef trade uh, uh, in the UK. What was that trip like to, to, to be able to see? Because I've heard a few stories that, and I know they love US beef out there. Oh, they, they do. And I guess what, what was interesting to me is the perspective change that occurred before and after the trip. So before the trip, as we start getting the background information, they're talking about everything they want out of the beef industry, the U.S. beef industry, as I want this beef to be all natural, I want it to be organic, I want it to be climate smart, all these kind of what I call check the boxes issues, right? Then we fly on over there, and in the meantime, war breaks out on the continent, Mm -hmm. and their perspectives have changed. Now it's all about what can we do about food security? And this whole idea that maybe instead of buying your beef from Russia and Ukraine and China, that you should probably be doing business with people with like values. And there was just a monumental shift. And I know that election uh, disturbance occurred after that. It's because they said, where is this relationship with the United States? Why isn't that front and center? Because they have the most in common with us. Mm -hmm. And as we got into that, that's when beef became we need to have beef as that center part of that trade. And I heard, I, did they call them steakhouses in, in, in England? They do. Okay, so um, I, I heard when you were there, you got to go into one of the aging rooms, and they had different cuts of beef in, you know, uh, Irish beef and here and there and Scottish. And the American beef seemed to be out because everyone was eating it. Yes, and also it was it was amazing their terminology misunderstanding as well. So as we were going through that aging cooler, I said, "You said this is all grass fed beef, right? And it's there's no yellow to the fat; it's all bright white." Yeah, yeah. And they said, "Oh yeah, it's grass fed until the last six weeks, then we feed it grain." And, and it was just like, really, that's the way the United States does it. And they had no idea, Lane. They had absolutely no idea. When they hear U.S. grain-fed beef, their image is the calf is born and grain begins to be fed to it all the way up until the time it's processed. To me, it was one of those Yellowstone misinterpretations of what the world's like. And it, to me, it was just an eye-awakening point at that time. Do they watch Yellowstone over in the U.K.? I think everybody watches Yellowstone. Uh, so obviously, we're being from Montana and travel, and I'm sure you guys have always been asking. And nothing, nothing against our friends in Texas, but for my whole career, somebody sees you in the airport wearing a cowboy hat, and they are, "Are you from Texas?" I'm like, "No, I'm from where those lonesome dove guys couldn't survive. I'm from Montana." <laughs> that always, that always goes over over everyone's yeah, head. Yeah. And uh, but now it's, "Are you from Yellowstone? Are you, you're from Montana? Are you from Montana?" I always get asked that, and then they always ask, "Do you watch Yellowstone?" I'm like, I said, I watched the one episode. Where that brand new calf got pulled, it was <laughs> dry, it 400 runs. pounds, and it had an ear tag. <laughs> but I will tell you this, Lane, and I can say it with certainty. As I've traveled through the airports, never, ever, when I'm wearing my hat, as somebody said, I see you're wearing a cowboy hat. Are you from Minnesota? <laughs> never. <laughs> well, and again, I, I will say that, that Yellowstone, I think, has provided that people just want especially I think COVID really shined a light on that. People want to be to be engaged with that rural lifestyle. And they've been separated for so many generations. So, yeah, it can be, you know, a little conflicting for me as a Montana native to see people moving into Montana and everything. And I know you can't stop progress or whatnot, but when people are wearing cowboy boots and cowboy hats, that means they're buying beef Green. when they're – at the restaurant and they're supporting their local producers as well so i can be conflicted but there's also people want to embrace that western way and i tell you what there's a romance to this whole ranching lifestyle that's why they're watching it they're watching for the scenery the cowboy hats the swag for lack of a better term i mean they just like that whole image of the way we get to live And, and, and again i i i just i i don't want to watch it and and you know judge it for you know getting something you know, wrong or inaccurate, but I'm like, I watch Lonesome Dove. I, I watch Lonesome Dove all the time. And there was a lot of things like, 
oh, that, that wasn't done right. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, and that's one of my favorite shows. But uh, it, it is, I, I laugh at everyone asks if I'm from Montana. And I'm like, yeah, actually, actually I <laughs> I am. But uh, overall, that, that, that trip to the UK, you think that's a great opportunity, though, to, to really grow that opportunity as they create new trade relationships as truly their own entity apart from the EU. And, and, and as you pointed out, there is no doubt U.S. beef is the preferred beef in the world. That's why that uh, counter was out of beef. That's why they're short on beef. Corn-fed U.S. beef is the number one product for beef in the world. Now, obviously, issues, there's a lot of issues that, like, we didn't even see popping up, like the SEC regulations. We, we, who would have thought that we would have been talking about SEC issues you know, six months ago, eight months ago, or, or even at convention. So we, we, we have issues that NCBA is looking at. They have the spotlight on, but there's also issues that are going to pop up along the way. But, but Mark, as we round out 2022 and head into 2023, what are those key issues that we know are on the horizon that, uh, that the team is uh, focusing on? I, I, I'd have to definitely say that uh, regulatory overreach is probably on the top of everybody's mind. They're wondering what's, wondering what's going to happen with the waters of the U.S., what's happened since the navigable protection, waters protection has been rolled back. They're concerned about uh, how some of those programs are going to be used or allocated out in the country. We're waiting to see if some of the uh, decisions that come in from the uh, Supreme Court will be favorable to us. We think they will be. Uh, and that will help direct the direction that agencies go and how they work with us out in the country. And that was definitely, I think it was actually heightened by the drought uh, that people are experiencing because then all of a sudden they're keyed in on things like the programs, the insurance, uh, the, all those different things that are factors and affect their, their livelihood and their ability to, to find feed and forage for cattle. Lane, I just got to uh, tell you that I think our, our listeners and our producers need to be very aware of the fact that the midterm elections can bring uh, a big challenge for us because if the midterms do flip the House and or the Senate, we're going to see what I believe is regulatory overreach uh, go to its extreme. And the administration is going to be able to attack us on multiple fronts because they're still in charge of all the regulatory agencies. So I, I think the producer has to be keenly aware of, of what they're going to be facing. And and that's really the role of NCBA is to try and help that producer uh, battle back because we can't be in Washington, D.C. personally. I don't live there. But the team that's out there can, can, ad can address these issues and hit them head on. And so as you, as you listen to this, I hope everybody appreciates the fact that there's somebody out there taking a swing back rather than taking, taking the punch. <laughs> Well, and uh, Todd, as we look at that, you'll you'll be uh, moving into the role as president, uh, most likely come this fall. I know we have to have elections and stuff, but uh, uh, you'll be up for president, and uh, issues just like that will still be at the forefront. I guess what 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 are what are some of the things that uh, you foresee, and and also what you're looking forward to in, in the term ahead? Well, I I, I as I just uh, discussed, I I'm afraid that we are are going to be having a bullseye on us, and whether it's uh, WOTUS, whether it's uh, uh, climate change, well, however you want to term it, we seem to be the target uh, that some of the, the activists uh, believe, uh, you know, that we're, we're the problem. Actually, we're the solution, and I think we have to continue to convey that message. You know, Don and I have been a good team in this approach because He's much more of a nice guy, and I'm just an ornery cuss. So, I mean, that's, that's the way I approach things, and that's the way I will approach uh, uh, my term. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take things pretty aggressive. By God, Woodrow. We got Gus and Woodrow here. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, and again, um, as, as we look at these challenges, there's also wins along the way, too. And, and they could be small wins that producers didn't even know occurred, because the team in D.C. or in Denver, they're already moving on to that next issue. What, what have been some of the wins that uh, NCBA has accomplished uh, since uh, the convention wrapped up in Houston? Well, and, and I, I like to think of things a little broadly. So I, I like to ask the membership, if you would have guessed two years ago when COVID hit, when our markets went in half and all that 
bad news hit us, and it could have really destroyed this industry, right? 50% shut down overnight. If you would have been a prognosis guesser at that time and said, what would our industry look like today? If you would say there are calves bringing what they're bringing and the market's uh, starting to rebound and producers have largely kept their operations intact, there's not many people would have taken that bet with you. To me, just the fact that we stuck to our principles, we stuck to our values, we said we're going to let capitalism fix this and we're going to make sure freedom continues to ring. I am very excited on where this industry landed given I think historically, when you look back at this period, you're going to say this is the most difficult period our industry has ever faced, ever. Yep. Any I, thoughts on that? I, I, I'd like I'd like to say that I think uh, a, a nod goes to our staff, especially the DC staff, as far as not only are they fighting for us and protecting us, they're also educating. They go out to the staffers, they go out to the representatives and emphasize where we have friends on both sides of the aisles and we make sure that they work together in benefit of the, of the industry. We don't try to pick winners and losers, we try to pick issues and policies that work for us. And during the, during the COVID, during the pandemic, our office was open every day and we went out and had meetings and lunches with everybody that we could, we had interactions, we built relationships very powerful stuff and very useful to move this industry forward. And the DC office never shut down. Never closed. During COVID. Fully staffed every day. Some work was allocated at home, but everybody came in. They were moving forward. The staff is invested. It's a wonderful thing to see. Well, and I just got to follow up with, with that a little bit. It's easy for Don and Mark and I uh, to get out in front of the producers and, and the producers to see us because we're, we're traveling. What they don't see is all the hard work that goes on behind the scenes, both in D.C. and Denver, because that's where the real talent is. Hey, we're just a fluff on the top. The fact is the work is being done by, by the folks in the trenches day in and day out, and I got to just take my hat off to them because um, they do a wonderful job. Yeah. Lane, one, maybe one thing I'd add to that as well is I think over the last couple of years, you know, there's always good that comes out of a like, kind of a tragic situation like COVID, I see a re-energized base at NCBA from a grassroots level. I don't know if you've been able to go through the meetings the last few days and just see standing room only after standing room only on a group of producers trying to develop policies for this organization. And I believe they now understand they've got the reins to this organization. They are at the power controls. And I think they're grabbing those reins and they're running with the policy. And I think that's the healthiest thing that's happened to NCBA in years, just to see that grassroots initiative begin to bubble over. Well, and I guess that leads into another point, you know, to the cattlemen and women that are listening to our conversation today. You know, it, it has been a tough time in the countryside, and uh, things are, are looking better. I mean, our my neck of the woods, it's been so droughty, and it, it gets people down. But for, for the folks that are listening to this that uh, are wondering, do, do I have a place in my state association? Because I, I don't have time to, to be in leadership. Uh, uh, what, what, are, what are the benefits of paying the NCBA membership as well on the national level? I, I guess, how, how, how can they be a part of this conversation to help improve the conditions for the livestock industry? You know, I've, I've always said, if you don't have the time, at least give the membership dollars to make sure you are investing in your future. And, and I think, you know, time is actually incredibly valuable, but anybody who put, becomes a member, to me, if you're disagreeing with issues with the NCBA, let's say there's an issue that you say maybe they're, they may be missing it a little bit from what I am. You don't run away from that organization when you disagree with them. What you ought to do is engage more fully and make sure that you bring your neighbors, your friends, who may have same like-mindedness, because at the end of the day, the majority rules so if you are indeed thinking correctly and that's the way it needs to be to be join the force join the fight and let's move this industry the way it needs needs to go i have a motto i've i've always loved to use and that is that there's strength in numbers and and don's exactly right join be a member participate if you can but help us help you be represented in all these different fights, both at the state capitals and the national capital, mm -hmm. and internationally when, when we're on the line. You know, we uh, coming up in, in one or two episodes after this one premieres, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, crypto 
cryptocurrencies in cattle. And uh, it, yeah, I've already recorded the show, but for our listeners, tune in now. It's going to be an interesting show with Nebraska rancher uh, uh, Jacqueline Wilson. But, you know, you've been able to travel and, and maybe hear some new innovations like uh, 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 the uh, shock collars for cows. You know, the invisible fences is one of the, the big ones. But what are some of those innovations that you've seen in the countryside or some of those new new items that can help producers out down the road? Well, I, performance analytics is is uh, is amazing in terms of the data processing that they can do, and I use that in our operation. And the detail that I'm able to glean back out of how my cattle are performing, how my genetics are, are performing, and ultimately uh, what's going to finish better, what isn't going to finish better, that goes to my bottom line. And the more information that we can get out of technology – uh, it, it just seems like we're improving our our ability to market our livestock. And the, the days of, of going to the sale barn the, the third uh, uh, Thursday of, of October and, and simply accepting what you got that day, on, because that's the way Grandpa did it, mm-hmm. those days are gone. I think the, today's producer has to be in the forefront of technology, and they have to embrace that technology because it's going to help make them – survive i've seen a lot of young people show up for the meetings in our convention and i'm really excited about that because they're even quicker to embrace technology in our case where we're doing some work with the ag research station uh we're doing satellite imaging we're doing drone work we're doing all kinds of different ways to analyze uh, analyze a uh, forage crop and, and the usage of it and and do the right thing for the landscape. And, I, and as young people adapt to that, they're using their smartphones, they're using their tablets on the go, on the spot. It's exciting. I, I think it will be make us better stewards. Well, uh, again, it's uh, it's been a, a great uh, meeting here in uh, Reno, and uh, we're coming up uh, to New Orleans. I, I guess what are the three of you looking forward to most uh, as we prepare for that uh, upcoming meeting at the end of January, first part of February? I don't have the dates in front of me, but it's always that time of the year. I assume yeah. you mean shorter charbroiled oysters, because that's what I'm looking yeah. forward to in uh, New Orleans. I love oysters, so but it's going to be a great time. It's a fun city. If you haven't been to New Orleans, you need to take in the life there, but we're going to, again, we're going to turn it over to, to Todd Wilkinson's presidency. And if you haven't had a chance to meet Todd Wilkinson, I tell you what, we've had just uh, an enjoyable time kind of being a partner in this yep. year's deal. But to his personality type is one that I think if everybody in New Orleans goes, your job should be to meet Todd Wilkinson. And you'll, <laughs> and you'll really enjoy the opportunity. Well, I, I, I think the producer, the, uh, the public that gets to see us at our, our main convention can experience the excitement that's going to be building in this industry. I, coming out of what we've come out of with COVID and all of those issues, to see the optimism that's out there and to, and to, just, to see the, the excitement about, hey, I'm getting a decent price for my calves and, and maybe there's a future for my son or my daughter in this operation, that, that's, that's rewarding to me. And it's exciting for me as I, I deal with my family and, and how they chart that course. But I, I keep coming back to the same point. And that is you have to put up or shut up. And, and ultimately, that's what we're here for. Um, you know, I, I get asked a, a lot of questions about, you know, NCBA has got lots of money and they pay you to do this and they pay you to do that. I, I hope your listeners understand that we get paid nothing for doing this. We're doing this because of our dedication to the industry and the fact that we think we can make a difference. And that's what you're going to see at the convention. Come in and enjoy 9,000 other uh, producers that are going to be there, and we're going to have a blast in New Orleans. Is uh, Crystal Gale going to do a private concert for your... <laughs> No, but I think Neil McCoy is going to be. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, uh, what, what are you looking forward to? Well, there? besides besides warm weather and great food, uh, it'll be the networking, the camaraderie with friends and colleagues, meeting new friends, and on top of that, uh, the va- the ability to help maintain and, and make our operations thrive. If we learn how to use the wheel, we don't have to invent it; we just have to learn how to use it better. No, it's going to be a great time down there. I am just very grateful that i don't have three conventions back to back in new orleans so last time cattle industry convention was down there i had farm bureau american farm bureau american sheep industry and then 
cattle industry convention. Oh, my. I was down there 17 days straight. Oh, my. I don't ever care to go to Bourbon Street so again. So you're a Mardi Gras expert. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, sh- you, you should ask Ethan Lane about uh, the, the fine establishments he, he <laughs> took me to as well. He, uh, I don't think he wants uh, the Montana Cowboy going to some of those white uh, table cloth places uh, ever again because uh, I don't know how to eat uh, peeled shrimp or the the shrimp with the casing stolen, whatever it's called. You, unpeeled. You had to, unpeeled. I'd say unpeeled. 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 Like. I got all flustered talking about <laughs> my memories of uh, 17 days in New Orleans. But uh, for our friends uh, tuning in, if you get a chance, uh, visit ncba.org and, and visit the details on, on the upcoming convention. Uh, just the the Cattlemen's Colleges that, that take place there, the, the trade show. And, of course, one of my favorite parts when I do get a break to run down is to see uh, uh, Dr. Ron Gill, Kurt Pate, Dean Fish, and, 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 and everyone that's a part of that demonstration arena. It's fun to watch real hands, horseback, run footwork, heifers, and, and, and all the technology that, that is at that trade show. It's pretty neat to see. Yeah, that Cattlemen's College is a special event. Yep, yep. So... But, uh, hey, friends, thank you for joining us, and thank the three of you for taking a few minutes out, out of our day here in Reno. Uh, that will do it for today's Cattlemen's Call podcast. I'm Lane Nordland. We'll catch you next time. Thanks for tuning in to NCBA's Cattlemen's Call podcast with Lane Nordland. For more information, visit ncba.org and make sure to subscribe to the podcast today.